Uh, can everyone hear me like this, or should I be closer to the mic? Um, it's fine. Okay, so we've seen some nice, uh, some nice presentations from Antonia and Erwin, and uh, you even just trained a, a pendulum in, uh, in simulation. But ultimately, yeah, we're often looking for good performance in the real world, and uh, also this session is about uh, real robotic learning as well. So that's what we're going to talk about. My name is Bas, and uh, together with Jelle, we're both PhD students in the group of uh, Jens at the Technical University of Delft. And we'll be uh, pinpointing a few of the uh, challenges of real robotic uh, reinforcement learning and common pitfalls on how to uh, um, accommodate for them with a new toolkit we've been uh, creating called ERX. So we've seen that, um, that you can get performance in, in simulation. Um, and that can even be hard, but going to the real world can even be harder. So Aaron already mentioned it, but uh, yeah, in that, in like in the Isaac gym where we can have a million steps per second, the real world, yeah, is restricted to real time. Also, unsafe behaviors such as exploratory actions when the policy is not yet um, working can be unsafe. And finally, um, yeah, a, re a reset in the uh, in the simulator can be as simple as calling a function, while in the real world you will actually need to move and use the physics of the real, real world to reset a, uh, an environment. So, um, alongside, you still have the similar challenges, you would also have the simulations so on the specified task and how to find the right hyperparameters for the uh, optimization algorithm you use to solve the task. Um, so you could argue, why not just train a simulation and transfer that policy to the real world? And that's also what we saw with the Isaac Jim approach, because you can yeah, simulate fast in real time, simulated learning is inherently safe, and simulators can reset to any arbitrary state. Also, debugging and doing some hyper-parameter hyper optimization can be easier in simulation, because you can get more information out of the simulator than you get in the real world. So this could be a statement, simulation is all you need. However, perhaps if people have tried this already, um, yeah, you will probably uh, get cheated because, uh, for example, in this simple environment, we have cheating where we try to run as fast as possible to the right. Reinforcement learning algorithms can learn policies that are unlikely to transfer to the real world. Another example here in the donkey race uh, environment, it's again something, yeah, we don't really want to transfer to the real world and is unlikely to transfer to the real world. So the other extreme could be simulations are doomed to succeed and reinforcement learning algorithms will find a way to maximize reward by exploiting the physics engine. Uh, and yeah, you cannot cheat the real world, but you may cheat the simulator. These are the two extremes and yeah, we believe that uh, yeah, the, the answer lies somewhere in between, and you should always have this mantra called all models are wrong, but some are useful. And yeah, guidelines for Sinto Real could be summed as follows. Try to mis minimize model mismatch, in other words, try to get the simulator as close as possible to the real world, but acknowledge that your model is wrong. Know your robot and try to mitigate the relevant mismatches. Um, this seems easier said than done. And um, yeah, in the proceeding of this talk, I will highlight a few pitfalls that could, uh, could uh, make you observe a performance gap between simulation and reality. So common model mismatches. The first one is fairly simple. It's, um, yeah, you train uh, in an environment, a simulation, but then in the real world, you uh, actually evaluate it using a collision avoidance filter in between there, and you didn't train it there. So the reinforcement learning agent didn't know in simulation that this collision avoidance was on and as such you might see very good performance to the left without the collision avoidance filter but if you even add this collision avoidance filter then during evaluation it might stall so an easy solution is to also train with the collision avoidance filter turned on and what you might actually observe is that it trains different kinds of policies that are qualitatively different and try to avoid um, actions that might cause the uh, collision avoidance filter to be activated. So for the other common pitfalls, we have a real um, pendulum system here in front of us. So we trained already in one in, uh, simulation. 
we will use this uh, system, which is a pendulum. It's actually a disc with a with a mass on the on the disc at the end, and it will act as a uh, as a pendulum. And we will show we will use this system to, to showcase a few other pitfalls. So the first one is um, yeah we cannot really send uh, exploratory actions directly to the actuator of the pendulum because it will likely break the actuator uh, because it's uh, yeah high frequency actions are, are, are bad because of wear and tear. So if we add this filter in there, we, we should actually be careful there because this filter often has a, a piece of memory in there. It's a low pass filter. So in order to yeah, not forget about Markov, we should actually feed back the action and use it as an observation uh, to the agent as well. Otherwise we make the problem unnecessarily hard. Um, and then the next one would be, um, suppose you have a simulator, but you don't have the accurate dynamics. Um, so we have a, a an ODE simulator here for um, we've created a, a, a we've identified a system for the pendulum we have here in front of us. But suppose the model uh, dynamics aren't exactly right, so we would see good performance in simulation where it's able to swing up. But then in the real world, yeah, it fails. One solution could be uh, domain randomization, so you essentially change the parameters while training, so you make the agent train on various different. Um, environments at the same time and hope that it becomes robust to, uh, to these uh, different model parameters. And if you would actually do that with the pendulum, uh, we could get zero shot since the real performance that actually works again. So this is a, a neat way to, to solve uh, model inaccuracies. Here you see the, uh, the difference in performance. Another performance killer is delays. Um, you could Visualize the delay as follows. So the filter sends an action, but it actually takes some time. It could even take one full time set before this action is actually applied in the real world. In order to account for this, and um, or again here, you can see that um, we train without the delay, and then we evaluate with the delay, and indeed we see that the performance uh, yeah, degrades. Again, a simple solution would be in order to restore the market property to uh, feedback another action. Um, by feeding back this other action and then training with the delay, we again can get performance that is fairly similar to the case where you don't have any delays. So again, try to make the uh, simulator as close as possible to the real world and use everything you can to do that. Um, oftentimes we also, also train in simulation using uh, a, sequential, uh, uh, sequential environment. So the environment basically waits for us to calculate an action and then apply the action. But then when we go to the real world, we might use an asynchronous framework such as ROS, which we highlight here with the dotted lines. So we train simulation, it's fully uh, synchronized, but then we evaluate. And yeah, sometimes uh, we get one time step delay and sometimes we do not. And actually this can hamper performance really bad. So another thing, one thing to do is try to get the, um, actions to be synchronized with the inputs uh, when you actually evaluate in the real world. So we've shown four uh, different uh, performance killers, basically model uh, inaccuracies, which you can account for with domain randomization. Uh, we've talked about uh, changing the market decision process. So the filters you would have in the real world, try to also include them in simulation. When you are dealing with delays, simulate delays as well. And if you have asynchronous communication, try to make them synchronize again or train with asynchronous communication as well. All these common pitfalls, we've uh, tried to incorporate them in our um, in a new tool called ERX. And yet, yet we'll talk about that a bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, With the delays. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, is there like a, a big difference between like, there's like a, so the pendulum has like an output, right? And then, or sorry, the sorry, agent has an output like feedback. Do you need like two feedbacks, or do you like just get like feedback from the delay? Does it matter? Does that, does that make sense? Because like the filter and the delay are like two more information steps. So, so basically the filter has a bit of memory, right? Yeah. Um, and then the output from the filter, yeah. 
is get, again delayed by one time step. So you would actually need two actions, so the previous two actions, in order to restore the market for two. Are there more questions? Then we will continue with yellow. So um, having discussed the challenges of bringing um, simulated robot learning to the real world, we've come to uh, EagerX, uh, the toolkit uh, Boss and we are currently working on. So uh, EagerX is a, a Python free framework that lets you easily define OpenAIGM environments that work both in simulation and in the real world. So in EagerX, we again see an agent as a, an uh, environments as we've seen before in, uh, in many uh, presentations already. But in this case, the environment is in uh, a gym environment. Uh, but in EagerX, this environment uh, consists of uh, nodes. And these nodes uh, together are interconnected and form a graph. So in EagerX, the environment in the end is a graph of nodes. But uh, yeah, what could this node be? Uh, it could be, for example, uh, a classifier, that uh, gets us input to images and outputs uh, the classification results. It could also be a, a controller, like a PID controller, and that uh, receives a red reference and uh, should ensure to track this reference. So uh, let's go back to the uh, pendulum example and uh, look at the graph uh, for this pendulum example. On the left hand side, we see the, the agent, and on the right hand side, we see uh, the hardware. So uh, we use a webcam for visualization and um, we have the pendulum system. And this graph consists of uh, five nodes in total. So we have a node responsible for reading uh, the webcam images, uh, a node for reading the uh, angle uh, information, uh, a node for sending actions to the pendulum system. Uh, we have an overlay node which will print information on uh, the images uh, and we have a low pass filter to keep everything safe. Uh, in eager X, uh, we make a distinction between uh, engine nodes and agnostic nodes. With engine nodes, we mean uh, we refer to nodes that are specific for the engine that is used. An engine could, for example, be a simulator, but uh, could also be the real world. So on the right hand side, we see the engine nodes, and these uh, nodes have a, a specific implementation uh, for reality. So this webcam uh, reader, for example, we cannot uh, use this in the simulation. So if we go to simulation, then we see that these engine nodes, um, they are uh, changing while the agnostic nodes uh, remain the same. And we can group these uh, nodes together that belong to certain objects. Uh, in this case, we'll then get a pendulum object and a camera object. Uh, and these objects are agnostic again. And these uh, implementations of these objects have, uh, um, yeah, they use different nodes when going from reality to simulation. And in this way, we end up with uh, an agnostic graph, uh, a graph that's agnostic to the engine that is used. So this graph will be exactly the same, both in simulation and in reality. Um, and at runtime, uh, we uh, select the appropriate uh, engine nodes based on the physics engine that is chosen by the user. So uh, EagerX aims to smoothen um, sim to real, and we do this by uh, letting users uh, easily define, uh, easily switch from reality to, uh, to, from simulation to the real world, uh, just by uh, specifying the engine. Uh, and we also want users to uh, allow to mitigate model uh, mismatches by allowing uh, by having features such as domain randomization, uh, delay simulation, and uh, synchronizing inputs and outputs, of which the importance was already discussed by us. But I'll get, go a bit more uh, into that here. So on the left hand side we see an uh, asynchronous framework, and on the right hand side we see a synchronous framework. We're sending the exact same actions uh, in both cases, and uh, while changing the real time factor. And on the bottom, we see the trajectories resulting from these actions uh, for different values of the real time factor. On the left hand side, we see that a trajectory starts to diverge uh, in an asynchronous framework, while in uh, the right hand side, uh, it's not uh, when it's synchronizing. So, this also demonstrates the importance of the synchronization. 
Uh, furthermore, a resetting robot is not trivial in the real world. So uh, EagerX allows users to define reset routines and also allows users to uh, define uh, safety layers in order to make sure that robot learning uh, is safe, both in, uh, in the real world. Also, we aim to uh, provide a uh, user-friendly tool. Uh, and therefore, um, one of the things we've developed is a, a user interface to let you easily define uh, gym environments. And also in EagerX, you can uh, live plot uh, internode uh, communication, uh, which can help debugging or uh, to see whether references uh, are tracked. Um, in EagerX, we chose for a modular design. So uh, here we see an example where uh, we're, uh, we have an environment with uh, two product beds. And let's say we want to uh, add another uh, object to this environment. Uh, here we add a manipulator and a can and we can do this in the user interface but also in code um, and then we have constructed a new environment consisting of uh, these uh, objects and in this way we can um, create complex environment with the objects uh, and nodes as uh, building blocks so um, now we go to a, a live demo with the uh, pendant uh, system uh, that we already uh, discussed so uh, let's do that So in this uh, demo, we're going to train a simulation to swing up this pendulum and then go to the real system. Uh, and here in, uh, we can visualize the graph that we uh, are using, which we already showed in the slides as well. And for example, uh, here we could also add um, uh, sensor delays to uh, simulate delays. So uh, first we will train uh, the robot um, uh, or train the policy in the simulation and then uh, see if this zero shots uh, to the real system. And as mentioned before, we can live plot um, internode communication. For example, here we're looking at uh, the action that is uh, um, sent by the agent and the filtered version that results from the low pass filter. And we see that the pendulum is slowly starting to swing up. So currently our uh, toolkit is um, maintained and developed by uh, Boss and uh, me, and there's uh, documentation available, and there are also uh, tutorials available on Colab, which uh, one of those you will be doing in a couple of uh, minutes. And we ensure code stability through a uh, CI. Oh, we're going to the real system. It's now performing the reset routine. It starts to swing up, and we see that um, this policy uh, zero shots to the uh, real system. Uh, to the real system. Um, on the status of the project, um, yeah, there's a small disclaimer. We're uh, still working towards uh, the first uh, stable release. So uh, the tool is not as, as mature as, uh, for example, a stable baseline at this point. But uh, yeah, we're also looking forward to uh, see people contribute to this project if you're if you're ready. To.
So now we'll go to the uh, answers. Oh, uh, first we have, uh, uh, are there any questions at this point? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just curious about your part, which is the stop-shelf part, which is a custom. Uh, this is an um, in-house build at our university. It's uh, very nice for, uh, yeah, for, as a toy example, for control problems or for uh, these kinds of things. Any more questions? Maybe uh, on the chat. Yeah. Or, yeah. How, how long have you guys been working on this? Uh, I guess two years. Um, for for a year. A year. Repeat the, the question. Was the for uh, for a year. No. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. so, so the question was for how long have you been working uh, on the code base, and we've been uh, working on this for a year. Any questions on uh, this one? Mm -hmm. So I think we can continue then to the hands-on session with uh, EGRX. So um, there's a link in the, in the website to the uh, collab for, uh, for a hands-on session with EGRX. Um, so for this uh, collab session, one uh, important thing to do is uh, to uh, activate the GPU on Colab because it will uh, speed up learning because we're gonna actually gonna train policy here uh, on Colab and uh, it will be faster if you uh, activate uh, the GPU. So let's do that. I mean, just to let you know, yeah. So and um, next we need to uh, set up the notebook, uh, and for this you need to uh, run the first cell, and this will uh, install dependencies, uh, and it uh, might take some time, so it's uh, good to do it uh, right at. And uh, in the meantime, I will explain what this uh, tutorial or this uh, hands-on session will be about. Um, so in, during this session, we will uh, uh, train a policy on the uh, well-known OpenAI gym uh, pattern uh, environments, which you've already seen in the, in the presentation. And uh, we want to transfer it uh, to this real system right here. Um, but this will probably not work out of the box uh, for a number of reasons, because the uh, pattern in OpenAI gym, it's, uh, it's a rod, while this is uh, more like a point mass that's uh, on the disk. Uh, and also the mass and length uh, are different. So for this, we're gonna apply uh, domain randomization in order to uh, make the transfer successful. So uh, in this tutorial, we will cover uh, constructing an environment using eager X and switching between uh, different engines. So going from simulation in uh, OpenAI Gym uh, to uh, another simulator based on the ordinary direct differential equations of this pendulum. And then uh, finally, we'll also go to real system and uh, we will challenge you to string up the, uh, the pendulum in simulation and see if it works on, the, on this uh, real system we have here. So you, you will be able to actually send us your pre-trained agents and we will run it on the real pendulum. Yeah, the Discord channel. Yeah. So uh, let's get started. Uh, first, um, we will import egress and uh, we will initialize it, which is uh, basically what the cell here says. Um, and next, we will download a pre-trained uh, policy from a uh, hugging face and um, visualize this policy uh, on the OpenAI gym panel. So here we see that the uh, pre-trained policy is successful in uh, swinging up the uh, gym pendulum. 
but um, yeah, we can try to um, to use this policy directly on the real system, but it's less likely, it's not so likely that this will transfer directly. So next we will create uh, our environment in eager X. Uh, and for this, we will create the uh, pendulum object. Uh, in eager X, we can also print some information about uh, the object, about the actuators uh, and the sensors. And uh, this is useful uh, um, in order to um, construct a graph and to know what sensors and actuators this object has. So here we can, for example, see that um, we have uh, sensors theta and uh, d theta, which correspond to the angle and angular velocity. Uh, and we have the actuator u, which uh, refers to the, the voltage that we send to the pendulum system. So next we will uh, construct a graph. Um, and we can uh, use the uh, eager uh, object of make um, method for this. And we um, create the pendulum with the sensors theta, d theta, the image for rendering uh, actuator u. Uh, and we also add some states. Uh, and these states we can reset at the beginning of each uh, episode. So uh, here we, uh, for example, add the states mass and length because we're going to vary over those states um, in order to perform domain randomization. So if we do this, uh, we end up with uh, a graph that uh, looks as follow. We have uh, the agent uh, on the left hand side with the action. Uh, and this is the voltage that we send to uh, the pendulum. Uh, and um, this pendulum has the sensors uh, theta, d theta, and uh, the image. Uh, the image we use for rendering, while theta and d theta are uh, fed back to the agent as uh, observations. So the next thing we're gonna do is now that we have created this graph, is we're gonna create uh, an environment. Uh, environment creation in eager X, um, yeah, closely resembles environment creation in OpenAI Gym. So if you're familiar with OpenAI Gym, this will probably uh, be quite familiar to you. Uh, so for creating environments, we basically have to um, implement three methods. Um, the init method for initializing uh, environments, here, for example, we uh, set the episode length and we initialize a counter for the steps. We also uh, have to uh, define the step method, which is called at every uh, time step, um, yeah, which performs the action and uh, receives observation. Uh, and in this method, what is returned is um, exactly the same as in a, a standard gym environment. So uh, it returns observation. Um, the rewards, a done flag, and an info dictionary. Uh, we also have to implement the reset method, which defines what happens at the beginning uh, of, an, uh, of an episode. Um, in the reset method, uh, you will later be asked in a, in a few moments to uh, add your own code uh, in order to perform uh, the domain randomization. So here you see uh, the states mass and length, and you'll be asked to uh, sample um, mass and different masses and lengths uh, in order to perform the main randomization to make sure that you transfer the uh, policy from the uh, open gym pendulum to this real system. Uh, next, we will initialize uh, the uh, engines. Uh, so as I said before, um, EagerX allows to easily switch from a uh, simulation to reality just by uh, changing uh, the engine. Now we're ready to uh, uh, initialize the uh, environments. So we create two environments, one for training and one for evaluation. And uh, we flatten these environments in order to make sure that they're uh, compatible with uh, stable baselines. And we can now check whether the pre-trained policy whether, that we have downloaded uh, earlier, whether this um, will work with the pendulum we have here. 
and we see that the uh, preprint policy um, is not successful in swinging up um, the simulated uh, pendulum that we have here. So uh, at this point, um, we, uh, yeah, we will ask you to uh, perform the domain randomization and choose uh, values for uh, the mass uh, and length to sample from in order to um, transfer uh, the policy from uh, the OpenIGM pendulum to uh, this real system. Um, Yeah, and one remark I would like to make is um, that if you experience some uh, problems, it uh, might help to uh, restart the kernel and uh, select run all in, in Cola. Um, so I'm not uh, applying domain registration at this point, and um, I will train for uh, 40 episodes. But we will see that this fails in the end. Um, so we actually need the domain randomization to um, sample the collect uh, parameters for the mass and length in order to uh, have a successful uh, transfer. So let's say you have uh, 10 minutes for this to do the exercise. Right? So, what I would suggest is to restart the kernel, run all the cells up until the point where we decide on what ranges we are going to vary the mass and the length. Select, to your best guess, even when looking and evaluating this, uh, this pendulum, what you think the mass and the length could be. Fill them in, and then uh, yeah, run all. So, uh, and then you'll see that it first tries to train in simulation on the simulated OpenAIG pendulum. It will probably manage, but then if it transfers to this real world pendulum, yeah, the question is whether you chose the, yeah, the ranges correctly. Uh, one hint is that in OpenAIG, they use a rod, while here we have a point mass. So you could look at the moments of inertia and figure out how you should modify the, ma the mass or the length in order to get similar dynamics. So this is again, yeah, going back to thinking about how you stimulate things for a sterile system and try to yeah, mitigate model mismatch. And if you manage to have a successful policy on the simulated on the second simulated environment, then please send us uh, the pre-trained agent and we will run it on the pendulum. So to see if it works, so actually, if you scroll down on the evaluation, it should actually swing up the, this uh, pendulum, which is not the gym pendulum, but which is the simulated environment of this one. If uh, your agent manages to actually swing up the pendulum, so it was around minus 200. minus 200, then you can send us uh the weight so it's just a zip file this over this code it's called the eager uh, x model channel Thank you. 
So is there anyone who uh, managed to uh, end up with a successful policy? Um, not yet, so uh, then uh, I'll go and uh, give you our solution. Yeah. 
So uh, we found that uh, if we um, sample from the uniform form distribution between uh, 30 uh, grams and, and 50 grams for the mass and uh, 10 centimeters and 12 centimeters uh, for uh, the pendulum length. Um, oh, for 14 actually, that we uh, managed to uh, swing it up. Um, we have to um, use a length that's actually uh, larger than the length of the uh, pendulum here because uh, the rod has its uh, center of mass uh, located differently from uh, this pendulum mass. So in order to train a policy with, uh, with this rod and transfer it to, um, to the disc pendulum, we have to overestimate the length of it. I don't know, did anyone um, manage to solve it? I don't know. Um, Shall we go to, to break maybe and see how the break the rest of the morning solves it? And then can maybe just show it to policy. Yeah. Or so I just just show and then we go to the break. I think. Okay. Wait. Yes, it, it takes some time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I suggest that we uh, have a, a lunch break now, and um, yeah, maybe you can try to uh, train policy during the lunch break, and um, we uh, will be able to evaluate it uh, after the break and see if it actually transfers to a to real pattern system. Well, we'll be back at uh, one thirty with uh, Amla Shirley uh, about uh, safety enforcement learning. And after break, we will also discuss hyperparameter tuning um, for reinforcement learning uh, with stable baselines and Optima. Uh, and we will also discuss advanced uses with uh, EagerX.